Hi, in this video, I'm going to discuss about some of the most important questions asked in uh, credit risk analytics interview. Uh, I'm also going to discuss about the answers of these questions. Uh, I'll keep the answers brief. If you really want to uh, understand uh, in detail, you of course have to do more research about these questions. These questions uh, are, are uh, going to be based on three major areas. One is uh, on regulations. The second one is on statistics and econometrics. And the third one, uh, the third area is uh, on risk modeling and, and rating. Okay, so the questions are mostly going to be uh, from these three areas. There are two parts to this lecture. In the first part, I'm going to take only the simple questions. And in the second part, I'm going to take the more advanced ones. Okay. Uh, the first, uh, of course, the area that I'm going to discuss here is, is you know, related to the risks, uh, the regulations. Okay. Uh, one question that is often asked is, uh, what were the main objectives of Basel I? If you know, in the Basel regulation, the first regulation that came about was Basel I. So what were the main objectives? They're no more in use, but, you know, you need to know uh, what were the, uh, you know, guidelines in Basel I. The primary focus was on credit risk. Okay. Uh, now we deal with other kinds of risk, but in Basel one, the primary focus was uh, on credit risk. The asset classification um, was, you know, initially or rather uh, for the first time was done based on the risk. Okay. So that was also part of the uh, Basel one. Banks that operate internationally are required to maintain 8% of the risk weighted assets. Okay. So that was also one of the norms. There are other norms also, but you know these are some of the you know few important things that you can uh, discuss in the interview if someone asks about the objectives uh, of the Basel one. So what are the main objectives in Basel two? Okay. Um, okay. So capital allocation is risk sensitive. That was something that was recognized. Okay. Uh, and, and recognized uh, in in a much more detailed way than Basel one. It also emphasized on enhancing disclosure requirements, something that was missing out on Basel 1. Uh, it also tried to ensure that risk is quantified using data, something that was also missing uh, uh, in Basel 1, where use of data uh, in terms of quantifying risk uh, wasn't given that much of importance in Basel 1, and, and it was, uh, you know, updated uh, or rather emphasized more in Basel 2. It also ensured that you know uh, everything aligned with economic and regulatory um, capital more closely. So, what are the three pillars of Basel II, which incorporates you know whatever we discussed in the last slide? Um, so, the, it has got three pillars. The first one is minimum capital requirements, wherein you know banks have to maintain capital for the three pillars of risk, namely credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. Okay, so banks have to maintain minimum capital uh, for these you know, three pillars of risk. Second one was supervisor review. The third one was market discipline, wherein uh, banks have to disclose uh, requirements to allow market participants, uh, and there are several market participants, uh, investors, for instance, to judge the capital adequacy of an institution. So that was also uh, one of the, you know, one of the three pillars which is the market discipline market discipline supervisor review and minimum capital requirement so you can include what we discussed in the last two slides if someone asks about what are the features of basel II in an interview so what is capital adequacy ratio so to keep it brief the answer is a ratio of banks capital to its risk so that's the most basic answer or pretty layman answers to uh, give an answer what is capital adequacy ratio or in a little more technical term it is the percentage of banks risk weighted assets rwa to the credit exposure okay so that's basically how you calculate the capital adequacy ratio so what are tier 1 and tier 2 capital the tier 1 capital is is the main asset of the bank is the main asset of the bank which include the shareholders equity and the disclosed reserves okay what is tier 2 it consists of undisclosed reserve okay tier 1 include disclosed reserves here it is uh, it includes uh, mainly undisclosed reserves and supplementary capital other than what is disclosed officially so there is some capital uh, not much though 
that is not disclosed by the bank and that's what uh, that's come under tier 2 capital what are the features of basel 3 you know basel 1 and basel 2 we discussed how do uh, we explain uh, the features of basel 3 and how are they different from basel 1 and 2 so the minimum com uh, common equity tiers are to be maintained by uh, banks okay uh, something that it takes from basel 2 as well uh, the, the tier 1 capital increased from 4% in Basel 2 to 6% in Basel 3. So that was an enhancement from a, a lower percent to higher percent of tier 1 capital, a compulsory capital to be maintained by banks. To maintain leverage ratio of 3%, okay, and what is leverage ratio? It is basically the ratio of tier 1 capital to the total exposure. So that has to be maintained at 3%. And there were introduction of LCR and SFR. We will discuss uh, in a little more detail in the next few slides. They are also um, introduced. So that's basically, uh, you know, uh, giving importance to what is known as liquidity uh, risk, something that wasn't discussed in Basel II. Okay, so we were only concerned about three types of risk: credit, market, and and uh, and operational. Uh, but you know there is uh, separately we uh, in Basel three separately liquidity risk uh, uh, where, where you know given more emphasis especially post uh, recession. So what is uh, an AIR IRB method? Okay, uh, I'm sure if you're working in Basel, these are pretty trivial questions. You know already you are familiar with risk management. These are very simple questions, but you can always you know brush up your fundamentals before going for interviews where. You know, people might ask you some of the very simple questions and, and you may not be able to answer unless you have, uh, you know, um, you have just brushed through the fundamentals, with, you know, uh, before the interview. So these are basically advanced internal rating uh, based approach uh, laid out by the uh, regulators, uh, which is Basel in this case. Uh, so banks are allowed to develop their own empirical models. Okay. Um, these were not the... Uh, I mean, uh, in the initial uh, Basel regulations, banks were not allowed to build their own empirical models, but um, later on they were they were allowed, and that come under what is known as ARB. So banks develop you know credit list models such as PD, LGD, EED models on their own instead of relying on the you know uh, direct percentage or the estimates from the regulators, which are more deterministic or you know taken directly from the industry benchmark rather than banks own data and, and observations. These are then used for computing the risk weighted asset instead of bank directly giving these uh, sorry regulators directly giving uh, numbers to compute the risk weighted assets banks can now you know develop their own models and that's what it is. How does IFRS 9 offlet is effect, affecting the credit loss modeling? Very important question often asked uh, nowadays is because IFRS 9 is coming into picture in most of the credit loss modeling. Well, um, initially uh, provisions uh, were based on expected, uh, sorry, uh, actual loss. I'm sorry, expected loss. I'm so really, really sorry, actual loss. Okay, but now uh, it incorporates the expected loss. Okay, so instead of just uh, actual loss, it, it now incorporates the expected loss. Uh, so IFRS 9 requires the credit risk models to calculate 12 month expected credit loss, and this is important, and lifetime expected credit losses. Okay, so uh, how does that affect the credit risk modeling? We will discuss that in another question. Okay, but this is at a much broader level that you know expected loss is, is coming into picture instead of the actual loss that used to you know happen before implementation of IFRS 9. Okay, so what is CCAR? If you are working with uh, risk regulations in the US, um, I'm sure you must be familiar with what CCAR is, right? And these are CCAR and DFAS are basically um, the post-crisis uh, regulatory frameworks um, uh, that framework by the Federal Reserve. Right? It stands for Comprehensive Capital Assessment and Review. Uh, it's a framework to super supervise bank holding companies. Now you can check the definition of bank holding companies. 
uh, you know it has a benchmark on the asset under management uh, and one that you know uh, meets that that benchmark uh, will be called as a bank holding companies so any bank holding company if, if someone um, fall in that category will be under uh, sika regulations uh, so it ensures that bank possesses uh, adequate capital um, capital structure is stable given various risk scenario you know that that it ensures okay so sika regulation ensures that you know these are uh, you know capital structure is stable given the various risk scenario scenarios that a bank is likely to face in future so it basically laid out it basically lays out uh, you know the baseline adverse and severely adverse stress scenario to the banks and allow the bank to you know uh, uh, perform this stress test to be able to uh, be ready for the future okay and and just to quantify uh, the risk involved in in such you know adverse and severely adverse scenarios what is ppnr <clears throat> pre provisioning net reserve uh, it, it it mainly deals with the forecasting of balance sheet or the you know, profit and loss um, it's more rigorous than before there was balance sheet modeling before ppnr but federal reserve came back with much more rigorous approach than what was available uh, previously there's more data there's wider macro data uh, and that's what uh, is important it, uh, the model covers far beyond traditional LM modeling okay often one question that is asked is you know how is PPNR different from the traditional LM modeling okay so uh, you, you can do uh, more research about how, how they are different what is ILAP <coughs> the ILAP rules requires firms to identify major manage and monitor liquidity and funding risk across different time horizons and stress scenarios consistent with the risk appetite established by the firm's management board Okay, so the takeaway point from this definition is that I love deals with um, liquidity. Okay, it deals with the liquidity uh, risk and funding risk. So, what are the features of IFRS 9? Okay, uh, obviously, IFRS 9 is, is an accounting regulation, um, but as a credit risk modeler, you also need to know the basics of IFRS 9. And oftentimes this question also is asked in in interviews. Um, so as I've already said, this the provision is based on expected loss uh, instead of actual loss, 12 month expected trade losses and lifetime expected trade losses, and then asset is classified at initial recognition uh, and may be reclassified later. Okay, so this is important. Uh, previously, before IFRS 9 was in picture, um, you would do everything at the time of origination and I mean the financial asset that was uh, under uh, consideration used to be valued um, whether it in terms of its price or in terms of the risk associated with the asset uh, at the time of origination or the, what we call as initial recognition and that's the way it was categorized into different you know, financial asset categories but IFRS 9 brings this regulation that you know it can well be reclassified later based on the risk and the different scenarios okay so risk and scenarios could change over time so classification uh, would also have to uh, keep you know keep that into or take that into consideration what are the objectives of building a credit risk credit rating model okay uh, you know simple questions straightforward answers so default probability calculation of default probability for rw calculations and erc economic risk capital calculations reporting firms credit positions to senior management okay it helps and and of course credit lending how do we calculate regulatory capital okay the formula is in front of you um okay so these are some of the uh you know short names i'll just you know read out the full, full names of this wcdr is the worst case default rate ma is the maturity adjustment DEAD is the downturn exposure or default dlgd is the downturn loss given default you put all of these uh, on the formula and, and you get the regulatory capital so what is combined risk weighted asset okay so it basically uh, 
you know combines the risk weighted asset for each type of risk such as credit risk market risk and and operational risk so it's just a, uh, a simple addition okay of the risk weighted as asset associated with each types of risk what are lcr and nsfr we have already discussed in brief slightly more in detail uh, during the recent financial crisis banks went out of liquidity because of their over reliance on um, short term wholesale funding from the interbank lending market and that's the reason why um, in the basel 3 regulators wanted these two uh, you know ratios to be reported to them okay and what this ratios do is uh, you know it ensures that banks have enough liquidity okay to uh, withstand any short term uh, you know liquidity stress so NF, nsfr is basically um, available amount of stable funding divided by the required amount of still stable funding okay so what is, how much money is available to what is required as simple as that lcr on the other hand is the high quality liquidity assets divided by the total net cash flows in the in, in next 30 days period and the um, the uh, the mandatory number for nsfr is 70% it has to be greater than 70% what is the difference between expected loss and unexpected loss? Expected loss is nothing but the average loss a bank expects for a given financial year. Something that it can calculate very easily. Unexpected loss, on the other hand, is the loss that exceeds the expected loss. Loss. You know, you can directly calculate it. Unexpected loss is just the uh, value at risk, uh, and and take the expected loss out of it, you get the unexpected loss. Okay, um, we have discussed about uh, IFRS 9, but how does IFRS 9 actually, uh, you know, uh, impact the model development, credit risk, credit risk model development, in, in particular PD, LDD, EDD model development? Okay, often is a very important question asked uh, in, in the interviews. Um, so it emphasizes on developing PD models uh, based on the point in time estimate um, rather than the uh, through the cycle. Okay, uh, why? Because point in time uh, estimation process take into takes into consideration amount, uh, sorry, account um, take into consideration the uh, changing economic cycle. Okay, something that TTC through the cycle uh, doesn't take. Uh, in uh, the ARIB. Uh, modeling framework it is assumed that pd scores are used while pricing loans at the origination okay while in uh, ifrs 9 um, the pd scores could change over time okay something would remain stagnant or something would not change ever uh, based on the arrb method but in ifrs 9 um, it could it could change over time hence the pricing hence the pricing could also change and all that have to be taken into uh, consideration while building models. What are the different features of CCAR? Uh, we have discussed these questions. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, the straightforward answers, BHC, bank holding companies have to possess adequate capital. Capital structure is stable given various risk scenarios. Um, capital distribution such as dividend payout, share purchases are acceptable in relation to regulatory minimum capital requirement. What is the main difference between a wholesale and a retail banking? Um, very easy questions, um, but you know, often ask these questions because the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the models are built differently for retail banking and wholesale banking. There are banks who work uh, primarily on retail banking and very less on wholesale banking and there are banks that have you know the primary portfolio could be wholesale banking and very little uh, little banking uh, but uh, most of the banks work in both areas right so one need to be very clear what's the difference wholesale banking refers to the service between merchant bank and the institutions okay so institution serving institution is is something that that's still by the wholesale banking whereas Retail banking refers to banking with individual customers, not the institutions, and very small institutions maybe. Smaller institutions and individual customers. 
Okay, now we'll discuss um, econometric questions and statistical modeling questions. Okay, very simple ones, but often we we overlook them and we sometimes do not know the answer perfectly in the interviews. How do we test multicollinearity? You know, this is often a question asked in regression modeling. We check the variance inflation factor, um, and then we we ensure that you know it doesn't go beyond uh, the benchmark. Uh, if you ignore that, then beta is only biased, and then with biased estimate, uh, you cannot go ahead with uh, building a model. How do we deal with autocorrelation? Uh, well, the first way uh, to you know check the first, uh, uh, I mean, how do uh, whether uh, autocorrelation is present in your regression is to do a statistical test known as Durbin Watson test. Um, uh, one way to get rid of Autocorrelation is to take the first difference. Uh, okay. How do you deal with heteroscedasticity? Uh, firstly, you, you need to uh, do some manual checks like plotting the error. You can get to know whether there is presence of heteroscedasticity or not. Uh, Bruce Pagan test. Uh, uh, that's a statistical test. You can you can uh, perform in order to be able to uh, know whether there is presence of heteroscedasticity or not. So what are the remedies? Take the box cost uh, transformation that makes the variable normal. Okay, so that one way of doing that using WLS instead of OLS, weighted least square instead of ordinary least square. What are the metrics used for model monitoring? ROC, AOC, receiver operating characteristics, area under curve, Gini, uh, Kolmogorov's mirror statistics, root mean square. Um, error, accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, PSI report and so on. So we can you know dig more into them. You know, we'll discuss more about these in the next video where you know we're going to have more advanced questions on in statistical modeling. But these are some of the you know major uh, metrics used for modeling monitoring. What are the aspects of model risk? Model risk involve basically model theory. Model building, model validation, model implementation, backtesting, and monitoring. You know, model risk management, uh, popularly known as the MRM, uh, deals with uh, all this, all of this. Okay. Um, and what are the reason behind uh, you know even worrying about model risk? Okay. So model risk is basically uh, you know understanding whether the model has been built properly. You know, there could be n reasons. Why a model uh, could have been built in a wrong way? Okay, there could be many reasons, right? Uh, and hundreds of them. And uh, a wrong model can be very hazardous, and that's important to be uh, really made sure. So error can happen from design through implementation. Uh, it could have been built incorrectly. All that have to be checked and and reviewed. Um, what are the different guidelines for model development? Uh, there should be clear statement of purpose. Um, model theory should be supported by literature, academic literature or industry literature or you know, literature from the regulators. All techniques used in the modeling should be explained at great detail with their limitations. This is important. Uh, all the people uh, explain uh, the good things about the techniques. People, uh, you know, do not include the limitations so that's also important rigorous assessment of data quality data should be representative of the portfolio uh, if you're working with sample data make sure that it represents the portfolio the population model testing is important checking models accuracy checking if the model is robust enough and stable assessing the model limitations evaluating models results over a range of inputs you know, all these things have to be carried out while building a model. Uh, also, uh, what is important is identifying situations where model is unreliable. So, what are the different guidelines related to model testing? Uh, so, you need to see whether the nature of the testing uh, uh, depends on the type of model and the context. So, all that have to be, uh, you know, uh, have to be taken into consideration. Uh, various statistical model, uh, statistical tests should be used instead of just a single test. Okay, so multiple statistical tests should be used instead of a single one for the same purpose. 
testing model performance over time and scenarios okay like out time validations and um, and out sample validation if you are if, if you you have uh, ever built a model you might have heard about all these things applying conservative approach that's also important um, what are the different aspects of model validations uh, so these are the points uh, to keep in mind validation should be independent of development hence the development team should be different from the validation team the development team cannot uh, validate the models there has to be an independent team that will challenge uh, the model developer uh, so challenge developer when needed models should be rejected if the deficiency cannot be addressed very strictly validation during the period of extreme financial and economic situations is important okay so it is not the uh, business as usual situation that's uh, uh, to be considered the extreme scenarios financial or economic situations should also be taken into consideration while building a model model validation should incorporate changes in products okay what if a new product is introduced in future whether the model is going to be good enough for the new product or not validation should be periodic annually half yearly or so on more frequently the better but obviously depending on the budget and, and the uh, regulatory requirements and so on model performance threshold and benchmark analysis should be part of the validation okay validation involves a number of tasks like evaluation of conceptual soundness okay uh, the theory behind building a model all the tools and techniques used ongoing monitoring and benchmarking outcome analysis and you know back testing and so on so validation involves the three major uh, you know steps we'll discuss more about these three steps in in detail so what are the different guidelines related to uh, conceptual soundness validation should confirm if a model has been verified with published research this is important okay uh, so you cannot simply refer to you know some blogs and and build a model based on that it has to be a peer reviewed journal i mean a research should have been uh, you know published in a peer reviewed uh, uh, journal or a respective journal or maybe a working paper from some of the top universities or maybe uh, a working paper from the regulators like basel or federal reserve or uh, or in you know, such credible uh, agencies sensitivity analysis how is uh, the model going to behave when there is small changes in the model parameters and how should, how does it make difference to the output you know uh, a small change uh, could make a lot of difference to the model output if that's what is happening then the model is large in changes to the output due to small change in the output is a sign of unstable model and hence it should be made stable you know that's a bad model checking robustness of the model by varying model input values um, and, and extremes stress testing and sensitivity test analysis should be reviewed by management okay and if it indicates it may be inaccurate unstable in certain situation then models should be modified if you think that you know uh, you know uh, the model is not performing well uh, or a model is not fit uh, un a model is in unstable in certain situations and it cannot be changed then in that case uh, there should be complete uh, rebuilt of the model uh, qualitative information uh, mostly from the experts uh, experts from the business uh, should also be uh, given due importance while evaluating the model ongoing monitoring uh, so it has many components it starts with model um, knowing whether the model is implemented properly for use so model implementation is very important the model has been built properly but if it's not implemented properly by the uh, you know uh, the mostly by the IT folks then it's of no use because then the output that comes out of the model is basically wrong model component should be uh, should perform as designed okay uh, code that implements the model should be tested rigorously okay so uh, both the unit testing and integration testing of the code should have been done should be done very very rigorously 
sensitivity analysis and checks of the robustness should be performed in monitoring. Overrides, uh, important thing, uh, if the business is overriding, that means it taking decisions, ignoring the output from the model, then all that have to be take, uh, all that have to be analyzed. If that's happening more often, then something wrong with the model, or maybe there is the model is not able to meet the requirements of the uh, of the uh, business, and then you will also have to see the regulatory side, and you know discuss all three, and see what is going to be the best for uh, uh, for the overall you know different situations. Benchmark analysis another important aspect of ongoing monitoring that should be done on a regular basis. So benchmark analysis could involve you know but an external benchmarking uh, internal as well sometimes you have uh, models built previously or models built for other similar portfolio then you know comparison is always going to give you an indication whether the model is performing uh, good enough or well enough or not outcome analysis so it's basically comparison of the model output to the actual outcome Okay, the model has been built and implemented. Now it's time to see whether the output that comes out of the model is actually similar to what was expected. Okay, so the uh, actual output is now compared with the model output. So it can be done in many ways. Uh, the two, the most important ways to do it is is doing statistical test and to uh, do expert uh, judgment analysis. So this is more quantitative, this is more qualitative. Uh, back testing is used for this comparison of actual outcomes with model forecast during the sample time period not used in the model. For example, if you have built a model for time period 1, you get the result in time period 2, you compare the outcome 1 with outcome 2 and see how are the different. If they are significantly different, something wrong in the model and then you have to go back and see. Or maybe sometimes you have to recalibrate the model. Okay, what is back testing? We discussed about back testing, but you know, you could be asked questions uh, to explain back testing more in detail. So it's one of the way to do outcome analysis, as we discussed in the previous slide. Example could be, you know, you have evaluator risk model in implementation, and the actual loss is compared with the model forecast loss. Okay, the actual loss you have received um, from the let's say the trading flows, and then you have the expected losses from the VAR model. Do a comparison, do a statistical test whether they are similar or they are significantly different and then you know you can come back with an analysis saying that whether the model is uh, performing as expected or not. It can be done at single point in time, one point in time, multiple point in times as well. Um, okay, so the, the result of VAC testing is that there could be you know signs right, you know green means everything is working fine, excellent, uh, umber, okay, um, you know, where, you know, it is okay, but, you know, there are issues, okay, but it's still okay to go ahead with uh, use, but there could be also red signs, where, you know, you see that the model is not performing at all, and in that situation, it has to be recalibrated, and sometimes rebuilt from scratch. For vendor models where you know the uh, banks has no control over, backtesting is very difficult, right? Because you do not know the uh, the model itself. You do not have access to the code and everything. So backtesting is only means of validating whether there is no access to code. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, one question that could be asked is what are the different aspects of model audit, right? Uh, I'm sure you might have heard about what is model audit if you are already working in risk management that is becoming very popular nowadays. Um, okay, so the features are or the as different you know aspects of model audit are as follows. The, uh, to audit if the uh, MRN, the model risk management team is effective and rigorous. Okay, so you know this is basically, so MRM actually are, are basically the review teams. So this is basically review reviewing the work of the review team okay that's interesting but that's important and that you know that's that's uh, given due importance nowadays by the regulators again uh, like validation and 
de development team should be independent. Similarly, validation and audit staff should also be independent. Audit should properly evaluate models, validation and backtesting. Uh, like validators or MRM people, they actually validate uh, the work of uh, model developers. Model auditors, they evaluate the work of model validators and backtesters. So how do we perform backtesting? You know, um, there are a few ways. Uh, there are a few metrics used in order to see whether the actual is similar to what was expected. Uh, one is to see the stability. Okay, uh, stability of the population. Whether the population has changed over time or not. When you do backtesting from you know for the current period, wherein you are trying to compare it with some uh, the model development period or period uh, well in past. You see where the population has changed over time and you use what is known as a population stability index or PSI to see whether there is a significant difference. We have a question on PSI so we will see how PSI is calculated later on in this uh, video. Discriminant power to test if the model is able to discriminate good and bad in the case of let's say PD and LGD. In L, sorry PD and in LGD and EAD of course there are, uh, there are ways to see whether you know uh, it is performing as expected or not. So we use AUC power start to see whether the discriminant ability of the model is good enough. Predictive power comparing actual basis versus the observed. Uh, the statistical thing that's used is the binomial test. Okay, that's used to see whether they are uh, they are similar or dissimilar. So what is stress testing? Often you will ask questions about uh, stress testing and so on. So the idea behind stress, stress testing is to study the impact of abnormal markets and its impact. Okay, if there is uh, abnormal situations, uh, how how the situations are going to impact uh, the model and, and and its output. Determining spread over risk free rate. So that's another reason why you go in for stress testing. Uh, risk period obviously is much less so you, you place a risk premium for that so it also helps in terms of pricing in terms of pricing okay to know um, you know what are the extra stress that's involved with this particular financial asset given you know the situations uh, that could that could come in the future and based on that you see uh, the spread the trade to spread regulatory requirement uh, it's uh, always a regulatory requirement to provide stress testing reports. In fact, C card, you know, DFAST are basically stress testing uh, framework for the bank to conduct on a regular basis. What are the different types of stress testing methods? Uh, few types I'll discuss sensitivity tests to see impacts of the change in the variables, um, variables as in the variables used in the model. Okay, for instance, the income of an individual or uh, the you know the credit score of the individual and so on but doesn't take into consideration the macroeconomic information okay it is only the variables related to the individuals or an institutions not the macro variables inflation interest rate and employment and so on scenario test to see impact of portfolio um, uh, in, in a, based on events okay so what if this event happens and what will happen if that even happens. Okay, so that's come under what is known as scenario testing. Scenario testing could be two types historical scenario testing, wherein you are taking only the situations or scenarios from history or things that have uh, occurred in past. So, taking only historical scenario is what is taken in historical stress testing. Hypothetical stress testing is another way of doing uh, scenario testing, wherein you are taking scenarios that have not yet happened. And that's the reason why we're calling them as hypothetical, something that have never been realized but could well happen. Although the probability or the chances are pretty small, but yet you cannot rule out. What are the challenges faced in stress testing? Um, few I'll discuss adhering to regulatory guidelines. Sometimes guidelines are so strict. Um, one uh, practical uh, issue that people face is that while market risk stress testing happens every day, credit risk it happens uh, less, much less frequently, or it could happen quarterly, or happily, or annually. 
So when you integrate across different uh, risk types, you face this challenge that how do you integrate the stress testing results from the market risk for market risk and with that of the trade risk? That's a big challenge. Uh, deciding on the reporting line, uh, frequency of the test are also some of the other challenges that you might face while doing stress testing. Okay, so question is, uh, another question that could be asked is, how is periodic model validation differs? Uh, what's the reason? To be sure that the model has good predictive power, variables in use should remain good predictors. Okay, uh, model should be uh, accurate and robust. Okay, um, okay. So you know when you are answering questions um, related to model validations or stress testing or back testing and so on, uh, the initial answer should be uh, crisp and to the point. And 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 the next, uh, you know, obviously you will expect questions. Uh, Supplementary questions, and then you go into details of how the, you know, these are being done, uh, and you, you discuss about the tools and techniques used to do this. Um, you know, we'll continue with some of the uh, the validation uh, points. Banks must measure the model performance. Banks must uh, regularly compare the realized default rate and the estimated PDs. Uh, external data, uh, model benchmarking. MRM and so on. So all these points can be included in your answer. Discuss some of the key validation principles. Um, okay, there are quite a number of we have already discussed quite a few, but you know, if in case you are asked this question directly, you can you can simply you know use these points, you know, from the slide. You can write it down and you can talk about it in the interview. Validation is about assessing the predictive ability of banks' risk estimates. The bank has the primary responsibility of validation. Validation is an iterative process. Important, right? It's not a, a one-off process. It's not a science, uh, so to say. It's, an, it's, it's a combination of science and art, where you can actually impress uh, regulators by, you know, uh, by being uh, very thorough with uh, the different iterations and making sure that uh, the final report is is robust enough. There is no single validation process, there are multiple ones, you need to select the one that suits the situation, the portfolio, the product and, and so on. Validation should uh, include both quantitative and qualitative elements, important is to uh, be part of the validation process. Uh, the principle of backtesting, what are the different principle of backtesting, uh, data stability whether the population has changed or not. Okay, that's the reason why people do uh, back testing. How will the PD rating system provide an ordinal ranking if the risk measure uh, measures consider? Okay, so you know these are some of the little more technical way of answering questions. You know we have discussed in much more layman way in the previous question, but this is slightly more technical where we are talking about uh, you know the ordinal ranking of the PD model, something that's used. Uh, mapping of the risk rating PD or calibration is good if there is. Uh, only marginal deviation from what was initially uh, there at the time of development. So the, if the ranking is very similar, perfect, no worries. If it is slightly deviating, fine, still okay, but under uh, supervision uh, or monitoring. But if it is significantly different, then there is issue. Uh, Backtesting involves calibration, discrimination and stability. Okay, uh, we have discussed about PSI, uh, but we didn't discuss about uh, how it's calculated, right? So, population study visit index is as an important part of backtesting uh, in credit risk modeling. Um, so, how do you calculate? Uh, this is the formula. Okay, so what do you basically do is that you, uh, you know, uh, you convert the population data that you have for the current period and that was used for the uh, development period. Or it could be any two periods, it may not be just you know current or development, it could also be other periods, and then you create uh, you know deciles. Okay, there will be 10 segments, right? You can create um, okay, and then you calculate the actual percentage and the expected percentage okay uh, of events, okay, and then you multiply that with the loan of that you know, just for no normalization purpose and see the difference, okay, and you will get a score. Um, 
if it is greater than 0.25, then there is a large shift in the population. If it lies between 0 0.1 and 0 0.25, then there is a moderate shift. And it's still okay, but you know, it has to be monitored properly. If it is less than 0.1, then there is no significant shift. You can you know, go ahead with the use. So how do you uh, measure the discriminative power? Uh, many ways. Uh, you can use a number of metrics, Gini, ROC, AUC, case, accuracy, and so on. Okay. In fact, uh, nowadays with uh, most proprietary softwares will obviously give uh, these uh, directly. Uh, if you are using open source ones, then you, you have to write your own code to find PSI or AUC or KS values. But you know, that should not be an issue as long as you understand uh, the, the way that this should be computed. Questions could be asked related to testing PD calibration. How do we calibrate a PD? Okay. Um, you do it with using binomial test whether um, uh, you know it, it deals with, with basically with two outcomes PD uh, obviously deals with mostly two outcomes default non-default or repeat of events uh, and the events should be independent these are some of the assumptions and you can go ahead with binomial test to see uh, the calibration okay. normal test VASI check one factor model these are some of the alternative ways to do it you can of course uh, uh, think more about uh, you know normality test and basic check test and so on and see how they are different from minimal test and so on. We'll discuss a few more questions related to PD calibration in the next video which is going to involve more advanced questions. Thank you.